public. I will now call the October 12th, 2021 regular business meeting to order. We will begin tonight by acknowledging that buildings within Minneapolis Public Schools are located within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota term for this region, Minnesota Makoche, translating to the land where the waters reflect the skies or cloudy waters. MPS recognizes the original peoples of this place and is committed to make ongoing efforts to educate the community about the relationship the Dakota people have to this area, both historically and today, as they remain here in their home. Thank you. As a reminder for anyone speaking tonight, including during public comment, please speak directly, clearly, and loudly into your microphone. For the benefit of all of us, but especially for our interpreters, for those using closed captions, and for those who normally rely on seeing faces to help them understand, we really do need to project our voices to be heard through masks. And if you do brief briefly remove your mask, please remember to put it back on properly after you've spoken. Thank you, Lou. Clerk Polly, will you please call the roll? Arneson. Present. Elamine. Here. Ali. Present. Surreal. Here. Inns. Here. Jordan. Here. Caprini. Polly is here. Chair Ellison? Here. Student Rep. Gabber Meskel? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Next, as you can see behind us, we have a number of new flags now displayed here in the boardroom. These flags represent the 11 federally recognized sovereign tribal nations within the geographic boundaries of Minnesota. Not only is it our privilege and duty to properly honor and recognize these tribal nations in this way, but I'm also excited about the opportunity it provides for our native students and families to see themselves represented in these flags. I had a discussion with a board me member this morning and she said she feels as if our, our ancestors are with us. She feels them behind us. To ensure a COVID safe experience, a small group of students, staff and families gathered a couple of weeks ago to place the flags during a small ceremony. In different times, we would have had the flags placed here tonight with all of us present, but we do instead have a brief video to play now, after which I will ask Director Jourdain and Superintendent Graff to make a few comments. Staff, can you please play the video? When I'm in a room and I see Native nations and Native flags representing, I, I feel proud. I feel proud of who I am. I feel proud to be Native. I feel proud to be Ojibwe and Anishinaabe. Proud of the people and of the, of the, the district or the company or the organization that is, uh, that is lifting that up and honoring that and making sure that Native representation matters. I feel seen. Um, I, feel, I felt heard. Um, by administrative administration and sa staff across the district. Many people tried to take our culture away from us and we we're trying to take it back and show that Native culture and people still exist. It's important for our students to see themselves and this is the first step in recognizing and acknowledging that we exist on the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. We have seven Ojibwe nations within Minnesota and then four Dakota communities. Today we've seen the installation of the all 11 of them in the Minneapolis School Board Assembly Room. So we had representation from our American Indian Parent Advisory Committee, our American Indian Youth Council, Ogichita Oyate, and American Indian staff. Many of our students come from the 11 nations that we installed today. Many of our students do not. We have more than 55 tribal nations represented from our students across the district. What's happening here today is a great first step in recognizing the unique cultural gifts that every American Indian student and their families and all tribal nations in Minnesota bring to the Minneapolis Public School District. It's important because we want to be represented. We want to be heard. We want to make sure that we are seen, that we are represented as, as a people. For far too long, we have not been represented. We have not been heard. We have a strong voice, and we want, we want people to listen to that voice. We are taking an intentional step 
in recognizing the sovereign status of the 11 tribal nations that we share geography with. The flags matter because to show that we are still here. beautiful. Uh, Director Jourdain, would you please like to make a few comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Ellison. <clears throat> Appreciate the opportunity. As a school board director, a longtime Minneapolis public school parent, and a member of the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe, this is a very proud and powerful moment for me to sit up here and see the Red Lake flag, which is this one right here, second in. Uh, from your right, um, and all these other flags from around uh, the tribal nations around from Minnesota as a symbol of the progress we have made. However slow it may be to become a city and a district that recognizes the first people of the land in all our diversity. As was mentioned in the video, there are MPS students representing more than 55 tribes, including uh, those 11 here in Minnesota. Curriculum, land, uh, curriculum, language, traditions, and land acknowledgement that you start our all, all our meetings with Chair Ellison, and now these flags are all such important recognitions. At times they may seem small, but there's a power found in the fact that these things can become routine and normal. As a sort of validation of the fact that this is truly native land, that native people are still here in our home. Public schools have a long and troubled history and in many cases present relationship um, issues with both native students and families, but we can reclaim our place and rebuild relationships. We can make sure that we pass along knowledge and learn from what's happened, and we can keep moving forward and we can keep pushing. Oh. Hold on one second. And to see the pride on the faces of those kids in those videos uh, and the parents in the video, I personally know Nation Wright, and he's a fantastic uh, parent and uh, a good, uh, all around good person, as well as softball player. Um, <laughs> he's really good. Uh, and as they stand next to their flags, that's all I need to keep me going. I wanna thank all the students and families across the district. Uh, the Indian Education Department under the leadership of Jennifer Simon and others that came before her, uh, Superintendent Graff, uh, Chair Ellison and all my colleagues on the board for this and all the steps that have been taken to affirm our native students and families. I look forward to continuing this work together. Thank you and back to you, Chair Ellison. Thank you, Director Jordan. Superintendent Graff. Uh, thank you, Chair Ellison. I'll just quickly echo uh, Director Jordan's comments and saying thank you to everyone who made this possible from those who've been advocating for greater representation and visibility for generations um, even those who preceded us here in Minneapolis public schools uh, to those who are staff who are here now including Indian Education Department Director Jennifer Simon and her team as well as Director of Engagement uh, Amanda Dion and for me to be present during this time when the flags were placed and to have these flags here with us um, was truly an honor and I, I hope they serve not only to support and provide the sense of pride that has been mentioned but also a constant reminder of the students we serve as we make decisions up here so thank you again chair ellison board directors minneapolis public schools for um, making this possible for our students thank you superintendent graff next we're going to approve the agenda for the rest of this evening director arneson can you please get a motion so moved. May I get a second? Second. Our agenda's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? 
Remember to hit the request to speak. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. That motion carries and we have an approved agenda. Director Polly, will you please move approval of the minutes before us? So moved. May I get a second? Second. The meetings was presented for the September 14th, 2021 meeting have been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. That motion carries and September 24th, September 14th, our meetings are approved. Our next item is public comments. Throughout the pandemic and while meeting virtually, we accepted public comment by voicemail in advance. As we now return to in-person meetings, we will continue to offer the option of submitting a comment by voicemail, as well as resume to practice of hearing comments in person. First, we will hear those comments that were submitted by voicemail. Staff, can you please play those comments? Hi, hi, my name is Leah Harp. I have a child at North High School and a child at Anwadan Middle School. And I'm curious that it, since it's been about a year since MPS severed the ties with the Minneapolis Police Department, how things have been going with maintaining peace and order in our schools, how do the principals and the other school personnel feel about this change? How does the board feel about this change? And is there any data that the parents can have access to seeing how um, things are going with safety? I've heard things at my schools and at other schools, and I'd like to know the official um, uh, opinion on this and the available data. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Eric and I am a parent of two MPS students. I am calling today to encourage the board to strongly reconsider changing the mandatory number of days to quarantine with a confirmed uh, close contact COVID case. Uh, currently, I'm not aware of any other district in the state that has a 14 day quarantine period uh, outside the state, including very large districts such as New York City, uh, do not go by a 14 day quarantine period. Um, and these students are missing out, especially the ones that you are aiming to uh, include with diversity and equity initiatives. Uh, these are the ones that are missing out the most. Um, but we are the, the, the core mission of the district is to teach children and, and children cannot be taught when they are not in school, especially when they're in a, uh, a format now where there really is no formal distance learning curriculum available right now. Uh, it's very ad hoc, very by the seat of the pants. And I think uh, with a confirmed negative test that falls within the CDC's guidance window after a close contact is confirmed, the student can produce a negative test result, they should be allowed to return to class immediately. Uh, if they do not want a test or they cannot be tested uh, or the test is positive, um, there needs to be uh, a modification of, of the, the quarantine period. 14 days is far too long and these students are already missing out um, and they've really missed out a lot as it is due to this virus. Thank you. Gary Marvin Davis and New Salem Educational Initiative, just a few blocks in the Davis Center in North Minneapolis, serving the students whom you academically abuse during the daytime. Extended comments at newsalemeducation.blogspot.com. With regard to that blog, I woke on uh, Sunday morning, October 3rd, to an absolute explosion on that blog, which already was receiving uh, uh, astronomical increases uh, across the summer as I relentlessly exposed the deficiencies of the Minneapolis public schools. Already now on October 7th, as I record these comments, the blog has exceeded by many thousands of hits my previous monthly record. 
Clearly, people from Russia to China, throughout the Middle East, many nations in Africa, and across the United States are interested in my examination of this locally centralized school district, which in the United States, with our mania for local control, uh, somewhere the revolution that needs to take place must take place at the local level. On that blog, I relentlessly exposed the failures of individual schools, the academic deficiencies of decision makers, departments that have, should have long since been uh, jettisoned, and the um, actual on-the-ground failure of the Minneapolis public schools to reach out to those students and those Hello, my name is Anna Mae Snyder, and I'm a mother of an elementary school student in the Minneapolis Public Schools. My son was sent home from school last Friday, October 1st, along with over 10 of his classmates because they had a close school contact who tested positive for COVID. He won't be able to go back to learn in person until October 15th, as our school district requires a 14-day quarantine. We gave my son a rapid test the day he was sent home and it was negative. Five days after the exposure, we gave him a PCR test, which also came back negative. Even if he continues to test negative and remain without symptoms, he won't be able to return to school for another week. The Minnesota Department of Health says that schools can, can consider quarantine periods of less than 14 days if certain conditions are met. If these conditions are met, MDH says that the quarantine can last only 10 days without testing or seven days with testing. My child and probably most of the children from his class who are in quarantine meet these conditions and should be able to return to school next Monday, not next Friday. My husband and I are privileged to be able to work from home so I don't have to miss work while my son is in quarantine. Many parents of MPS children though are not able to work from home and thus face significant hardship when their kids must remain home for an extended time period. My request is for the board to modify Minneapolis's quarantine policy so that it aligns with the recommendations of our own Department of Health. It is unfair to our kids who have already suffered so much to keep them out of school for so long when there are CDC approved ways to get them back to school faster. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Hi, um, my name is Samara Freemark, and I'm the parent of a second grader in the Minneapolis Public Schools. I'm calling today to express my deep concern about Minneapolis's COVID quarantine policies and um, the district's egregious lack of a testing program. Uh, yesterday, October 6th, I watched a press conference given by the governor and other officials, and I truly hope that every one of you watched it as well. Every single speaker at that press conference made two points. The first was that the most important thing is to keep our kids in school. As the speakers put it, the whole goal is to keep as many kids in school as possible. We need them to be here. They're meant to be in school. They're not meant to be home in front of a screen. Second, the speakers made clear that the state has offered assistance to every single school and district in Minnesota to implement testing programs to keep our kids in school. The state says they'll provide tests logistical help, and even funds to hire staff to implement these programs. All the schools and districts have to do is ask. At my child's school and in schools across Minneapolis, there is no testing protocol. The response to a COVID case is to impose a 14-day quarantine on large groups of students without giving anyone the option to come back to school with a negative test. Just a month into the school year, about half the children at my son's school have spent weeks quarantined at home. This policy is unreasonable and overreaching. It is wildly out of line with the recommendations of the CDC and the goals of the state of Minnesota, as well as policies at local private and charter schools, other public school districts in Minnesota, and other large urban school districts across the country. Us parents have been given no explanation for why Minneapolis is such an outlier or for why our district has failed to take advantage of state funds to create a testing program. This all adds up to a catastrophic undermining of the district's stated goal of in-person education, and our children are the ones paying the price. 
Thank you all for the opportunity to comment, and I truly hope that you revise. Dear Minneapolis Public School Board, this is Jessica Garris, parent of a student in sixth grade in the district. As COVID-19 numbers continue to go up on the Minneapolis Public School dashboard across the city and the state, Minneapolis public school parents, guardians, and the greater community are looking at many options to help keep students and staff safe. We are entering the second month of the 2021-22 school year and parents and community members demand action now to support schools with guidance and resources for an outdoor lunch option on all campuses every day except on days of extreme weather. This is not only a health safety issue, it is an equity issue. Thank you, and I look forward to your action. Hi, my name is Nicole Kamholtz. My daughter is a kindergartner. Um, at um, in Minneapolis Public Schools. I just wanted to make a comment um, based on the petition for the shortened quarantine. Um, my daughter just got done with a 14-day quarantine and um, it was a struggle, obviously, for most people. Um, academically, she was having a hard time doing her homework at home and physically, you know, being confined to just the backyard. Emotionally and socially, missing the beginning of the school year was really hard. Um, but uh, we definitely understand that rules need to be in place. But I also work at a school that has a quarantine of 10 days. And <clears throat> I really feel that the four days difference would make a huge difference in the fact that um, if we had to face another quarantine, you know, we really wouldn't do be able to do it as a family financially. Um, it's just too hard for us to be home and not working, especially with the no longer having the quarantine leave at work. So um, if you could consider the petition to shorten the quarantine to 10 days, that would be awesome. And I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Coolia Pringle, Midwest Regional Organizer for National Parents Union and a Bright Beam activist. I work with hundreds of Minneapolis public school parents, specifically black parents. I'm calling because it's Dyslexia Advocacy Month and I wanted to voice my concern around a lack of a literacy plan within Minneapolis public schools. I would like for the district to come up with a literacy plan rooted in the, in the science of reading, more ESSER money spent specifically on literacy, letters training for all K through three teachers, and assess and replace benchmark curriculum. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Louise. I am a parent to um, two Minneapolis Public School kiddos. And I was just calling to say that I appreciate the stability and the leadership that we've had with Superintendent Graff throughout the pandemic and through the CDD. Initially, when schools went distance learning, many of my friends in other districts did not have any sort of structure in their classrooms, and they met one to two times weekly. And right out of the gate in the beginning of the 2020 school year, my kids had all day class with their teachers, and they continued to learn throughout the pandemic when I saw many other districts falling behind. And I attribute a portion of that to the leadership that Superintendent Graff has provided. Additionally, while I was initially opposed to the CDD, we made the choice to switch to our community school and we have been nothing short of thrilled with the transition and being part of our community at the school level versus driving to a school outside of the community. Thank you for your time and I appreciate um, your listening and considering my comments. Thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Sarah Koshinska and I am a parent of a middle schooler at Sanford Middle School with Minneapolis Public Schools. I have just want to state that I appreciate the superintendent's <laughs> work and navigating over the last year and a half in extremely challenging times. 
think he's been doing a good job. Don't want to see change in our leadership in the middle of a pandemic. We need stability and to keep navigating what, what is really, really hard for the best of all of our children. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Dufferin, and I am a parent of two Edison students. Um, I guess my first comment is it's been uh, a weird couple of weeks at Edison, very disruptive um, and unfortunate, but I think the direction you're heading in in um, considering vaccines and testing for sports is the right way to go. Um, we just were temporarily shut down. It was unfortunate and disruptive and not good for anybody. And I think the way around that, the way to move forward is is by requiring vaccines or requiring testing. And I urge you to look at it beyond sports to other things as well, including just general education. I think we'd all be better off. Uh, the second thing is, you know, this is my 13th year now with a kid in Minneapolis schools. And um, as weird as and hard as this past 16 months have been with COVID, um, a lot of that is to do with COVID and not uh, to do with anything else. I think the leadership of uh, the superintendent um, and a lot of the tough decisions he's made and that you've made as a board um, have been really good and solid. And uh, I urge you to just keep on and um, maintain that steady, consistent leadership that you have um, and renew, renew the superintendent's contract um, because if there's one thing we need right now, it's it's a little consistency um, and a steady ship. So uh, I urge you to, to consider that going forward. Thanks very much for the time. Bye. Next, we will hear from those who signed up to provide comment with us here tonight. As staff projects the speaker list and our first speaker comes to the podium, I'll remind all of us of the public comment guidelines. Comments can be no more than two minutes each and must not mention identifiable information about individual staff or students and must not include profanity, insults, or threats. If identifiable information about individual students or staff are mentioned, I will turn off the microphone and end your comment time. And finally, remember that this is an opportunity for us to hear from the community and we will not respond in the moment to comments or questions. Um, Saidu Mohammed, not here. Okay, um, Carolyn Hood. Thank you. It's at the podium. Oh, it's, yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, is this okay? Yes. My name is Caroline Hood. I'm an MPS parent to a kindergartner and first grader and author of the petition you just heard with over 588 parent signatures. I'm also a licensed independent clinical social worker with expertise in adverse childhood experiences, substance use disorders, and mental illness. I come in partnership. I love this district. I love this city. Um, I have been and continue to request a reduction in the COVID quarantine timeframes from 14 days to the CDC's 10, with no test or seven with the test, or following the countless other districts in the state and across the country that are using effective test to stay protocol to keep kids learning in person. I was told by Superintendent Graff that the 14 day policy was the safest. And if COVID is the only risk we're managing, I completely agree. However, it's not. There is harm being done to kids and families by not more accurately and holistically calculating risk. The 14 day protocol is disregarding the mental health, social, emotional, developmental, academic, and economic risk that is associated with keeping children at home. Parents have called me in tears saying they are choosing a paycheck over their child or vice versa, saying children are being left home unattended without proper food or caregiving. There is no two weeks paid FFCRA sick leave for our working families and children are falling off a cliff. For MPS families, I'm hearing and experiencing that this is by far the most challenging part of this pandemic. It is made even more challenging when our colleagues, friends and family in Roseville, St. Paul, Edina, Rosemount, St. Louis Park, Eden Prairie, et cetera, don't have kids quarantining and at least not for the 14 days. 
The science doesn't support the 14 days for that close contact, the rate of transmission of COVID in schools that already have the really effective, the masking, the small groups is exceptionally low. The policy is solely focusing on the potential of a risk and ignoring the actual real harm that is happening by keeping our kids out of school. I beg you, we cannot wait for the vaccines for our littles. There's too many months of school left. Parents are suffering, we're struggling, um, and this is doable. This is a change we can make. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Persigo. Persigo, I'm sorry if I ruined that last name. Hello, my name is Cheryl Persigel, and I'm the parent of two recent South High School graduates. I'm here with other parents representing over two dozen South High students, teachers, staff, and families who've reached out to us unsolicited in the past few weeks to share their stories of disrespect and marginalization during the past two years, and who asked us to speak on their behalf. I'm here because while the direct experience of harm is theirs and not mine, the reality is they don't feel safe enough to come, to send an email or leave a voicemail, or let alone speak here before this administration or while being recorded on video. So what's their story? Piecing together everything I've learned from those directly impacted, I've come to believe that a vacuum of leadership at the district and at the school level over the past two years at South High has left it fragile, divisive, unsafe, and untethered. It would be easy to blame all this on the pandemic or on the fact that South sits at the geographic epicenter of the uprising, but that would be a deflection and a dodge. So I'm here to speak their truth as best I can to ask you to aggressively investigate these contributing factors that fall squarely at the feet of leadership. One, unwelcoming and increasingly dangerous and retaliatory school environment for BIPOC. Two, inappropriate and potentially, a potentially illegal disenrollment of primarily BIPOC students during the pandemic in violation of Minnesota Executive Order 2094 and Minnesota Department of Education attendance and truancy guidelines. Three, chronic unresponsiveness and lack of transparency in engaging and communicating with families, students, staff, and teachers. A vacuum of leadership. Whether the root cause is incompetence, neglect, or self-interest, the impact has been damaging. South High deserves better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria Cisneros. Uh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es María Cisneros. Good evening, hi, my name is María Cisneros. Soy líder del Sindicato Nacional de Padres. I'm the leader of the National Syndicate of Parents. Estoy aquí porque quiero que el distrito cree un plan. I'm here because I want the district creates a plan. De alfabetización. An alphabet alphabetization program. Or plan, para, I'm sorry. Para nuestros niños. For our kids. Que sufren por no poder leer, they are suffering not to be able to read, y no están en el nivel de la lectura, and they are not at a lecture level. No tenemos el tiempo, we don't have the time, para perderlo, to waste it. Esa hora, is now, para, para que nuestros niños, so our kids, es hora para que nuestros niños no sigan atrasados en el nivel de la lectura. It's time that our kids are not uh, behind on their uh, reading area. El distrito tiene mucho dinero. The district has a lot of money. Y es ahora de poner e invertir. And it's now the time to invest. Este dinero en calidad de lectura a nuestros niños. This money and the quality for a reading program for our kids. Para que estén en el nivel. So they can be up, up to the level. Quiero, queremos que nuestros maestros, we want that our teachers, estén fortalecidos, they have the strength they need, en la ciencia, and science, de la lectura, le, reading, 
con mucho amor, with a lot of uh, caring and love, pasión, passion, y paciencia, and patience, para motivar en la lectura a nuestros niños. To motivate our kids in uh, reading. Estoy educando y organizando. I'm educating and I'm organizing. A mi comunidad. My community. Para exigir lo mismo. To, the, to the ask them the same way. Para que nuestros niños tengan el nivel de lectura. So porque kids, es una vergüenza que nuestros niños no están al nivel. Muchas gracias. So our kids have the same level because it's a shame that our kids are not at the same level as others. Thank you very much. Gracias. Tonya John. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Graff. My name is Tonya John. I'm a parent and organizer and a delegate of the National Parent Union. Um, I just want um, to start, start off by just saying that parents are really struggling with everything, everything testing, 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 quarantine, quarantine instructions, instructions. Um, and just navigating through this system. Um, and some of the things that we don't need to struggle with is literacy. Um, so I just want to address that first. First, we need to ensure that Minneapolis School Board takes literacy serious for students in your district that do not know how to read. The numbers are staggering. We need to demand that you be bold and be the leaders that we can look up to and take action now. Give our families what they need to succeed. A district literacy plan, a dedicated more ESSER funds for fighting literacy, letters training for all K through three teachers, which has been a proven way to provide literacy to our students, and a benchmark curriculum. We need this and we demand this action now. Um, the other thing is too, is that parents are really watching where this money is going. They're coming to us and asking us, where is this money going? Is it going to go to our immediate needs to uh, address our resources gaps and to the learning gaps and things too? We teach parents how to, how to hold government systems accountable. And I just want to let you know that parents are watching to hold you accountable for where these funds go. To think wisely, think boldly, because we need your strong actions now. Thank you. Thank you. Nakima Levy Armstrong. Good evening, I'm Nikima Levy Armstrong, civil rights attorney, activist, and founder of the Racial Justice Network. You all just heard from my colleague, Cheryl Persico, who is a part of our education committee, about concerns about the climate at South High School, as well as some of the leadership issues there. I have um, read some of the information about what is happening with the leadership there, and I would urge you all to take a more robust approach with regard to determining who should be running South High School and listening very clearly to the concerns that are being raised by the parents and students who are Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Hmong, as well as students with disabilities and students who receive free and reduced lunch. I was appalled to learn about uh, students potentially being illegally disenrolled from South High School. And I believe there's a combination of factors as to why this is happening. I don't think that it should be blamed on the pandemic or on the murder of George Floyd. The reality is that we are expecting our school system to function as well as possible. And sometimes leadership is the place where we need to point our attention. So I would ask that you all not accept any excuses and that you hold leadership accountable for the climate at South High School. The other issue I want to speak to briefly is when I walked up, I did not expect to see a full-scale demonstration happening. And um, I pulled one of the people aside to ask them what was going on, and they raised concerns about the um, pandemic funds and whether they are being used appropriately to mitigate what is happening in our school system in terms of class sizes um, and the need for more resources and social distancing to help keep people safe. I also want to echo the concerns of the parents who signed a petition asking for a shift um, in the quarantine policy. My son attends a private school and essentially they sent out a notice and they don't have as stringent um, of policies as what we've seen um, at Minneapolis public schools and it hasn't resulted in a negative impact to students or their safety. So just things to consider. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Elijah Norris Holiday.
Hello, I'm Elijah Norris Holiday. Good evening, Board of Directors, Superintendent Graff, District Employees, NPS families, and others in attendance. I want to remind you all on September 14, 2021, you all approved the budget presented by Ed Graff and supported his office to apply for $159.4 million subsidy from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan, also known as ESSER 3 funds. We've received two appropriations from the federal government, ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 dollars already, and this will be the third round of funds that we are set to receive. The proposed budget outlines the priorities of the funding and echoes the preferences of the district. However, the proposed budget does not reflect the wants and the needs of the thousands of families within NPS and ignores the feedback provided from the NPS ESSER 3 investment presentation that clearly outlines in the presentation the need to invest in literacy outcomes for NPS students. Investments in new approach to address educational losses resulting from the pandemic and develop a comprehensive look at learning outcomes for the most disadvantaged students, black and brown students. Also reflected in the most recent proficiency data released from the district is that many of our black and brown children attending NPS are not receiving the necessary support in their education, or should I say the lack thereof. You've heard it from families today. You've heard it from me in the past. Our kids cannot read and write. According, according, to, the, to, the, according to the according to the district the district statistics, twenty three percent of students were color, proficient, were in, proficient math. in math, while three out of four white children met the basic standards indicating math proficiency. Even more astounding, only 28% of students of color were proficient in reading, while nearly 79% of white students were reading at the expected grade level. As alarming as those literary statistics are, we have reason to believe that the learning outcomes for black and brown students are much worse. But unfortunately, we still have yet to see the statistics from last year for me to substantiate that claim. In September of 2019, the school board meeting, Ed Graff admitted that the policies and practices currently in place are yielding inequitable results. His exact quote is where we believe that the system is designed to produce the results that we are seeing, advantaging some and disadvantaging others. I think it is safe to say that those disadvantaged students are black and brown students. Yet two years later, that very same system continues to fail our families and our students. Now we're provided with a once in a lifetime amount of funding from the federal government to address those disparities in literacy outcomes for our students. Still the budget recommended by the superintendent and his staff approved by this body does not reflect literacy as a priority. In fact, out of the $159.4 million, roughly about $1.8 million is directly allocated to address literacy outcomes. Elijah, please wrap up. Time is up. Can you wrap up? Yeah, I, I will. Thank you. That is less than 2% over the overall budget from the ESSER 3 funding and not literally is enough to support our students. It's not nearly enough. That's less than 2% of the funding that you are gonna receive from the ESSER 3 fundings. There is three reasonable acts that this board should strongly consider. First, develop a district literacy plan. Second, reallocate more ESSER three dollars towards literacy outcomes. And third, expands letter training for K through th uh, three teachers. And lastly, assess and replace the benchmark curriculum. And, and Chair Ellison, a lot of other people that was up here speaking went over the two minute, two minute mark. I know because I was watching on my phone. I don't appreciate the interruption. Um, I, I just ask that you be respectful when people from the community come up and we're talking to you about the issues that our students are facing. As a young person, um, I find that very disrespectful that you cut me off and you did not cut off other people. I just ask that you be equitable when you allow people to speak. Thank you. My name is Anita Newhouse, and I'm here as a parent of three recent South High School graduates and an actively engaged South High community member. As Cheryl mentioned a few minutes ago, we've received many unsolicited contacts about South High community members who are distressed about the impact of recent actions by MPS and South High School administration. While public comment guidelines don't allow me to share specifics, I can share a small glimpse of what students are experiencing and in their own words. I'm reading directly from five student letters. Quote, leadership claims to bring the South High community together. But from my perspective, there is nothing leadership has done in the past two years to bring the community together. Why lie to the community and claim that you, ha that you held it together? End quote. Quote, as a student of South High, during the time of George Floyd's murder, I did not once hear from district or school leadership personally or in the classroom. My teachers made it a priority to, to, to connect with me and my peers, so we were able to express our emotions and opinions. Leadership took no action to do so." End quote. Quote, we as students have so much pressure in our lives. 
but it does not get acknowledged most of the time. One of these pressures is being responsible for our work, our schoolwork, and our future. We have to meet expectations no matter what's happening in our lives. If we are expected to be responsible, but district and school leadership can't be responsible, what kind of role model is that? How caring is that? How can we trust leadership will listen to our voices and help, help make changes we want to see at our school? Will leadership even support us? End quote. Quote, I don't think leadership has the right to use the murder of George Floyd as an excuse for anything. I haven't seen district or school leadership help students or talk to them. The teachers are the ones who help students get through the school year. End quote. And finally, quote, due to the carelessness of leadership, the school has had some growing tension this fall. Students are still overwhelmed and stressed by the transition back to the community and leadership actions that have placed mistrust in the community. Many students rely on this school for support and as a form of family. How are we supposed to accept this? We can't, end quote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sammy Krasnowska. My name is Tammy Rosnaco. My youngest is a junior this year at Edison. I'm here tonight to urge you to support opening negotiations with Superintendent Graff. Minneapolis Public Schools has many problems and issues that are facing it right now. And they need immediate work and attention. I believe that leadership stability allows us to move forward on the problems that we face. Changing superintendents costs us time and opportunity. My guess is two years of lost opportunity. From the time a change were to be announced through the selection process, then onboarding, they need time to form a team, set up a plan, and then we hope a good selection was made. Two years before meaningful movement forward on issues that need work now. The superintendent was able to lead this district to the most significant structural changes in the last 20 years with the CDD at the direction of the board. He has led us through an unprecedented pandemic in which there were no good answers, there were only best answers. To spend a significant amount of time and resources to replace a competent superintendent to me is foolish. Give our current superintendent the direction to work on the very real problems we face. We don't have two years to waste, and our kids certainly don't. I'd also like to thank Minneapolis Public Schools, from the board all the way down to the staff in the buildings, for their continued efforts on COVID. Again, there haven't been perfect answers for anyone, but I, I do think that MPS has responded well. I would also, though, like to urge you to explore all possible options to increase the vaccination rates, including um, as a first step, perhaps requiring our athletes to be vaxxed or at least regularly tested, but anything else that, that is reasonable, that is legal, that will not cost us a lot of legal fees, we actually, that's the only way forward. It's the only way for any of us to get out of this is to increase those vaccination rates. So thank you. Thank you. Jill Pearson Wood. Good evening. I'm uh, Jill Pearson Wood. I'm an Edison parent of uh, two boys and I'm a longtime MPS uh, family. Later this evening, you'll be voting to re-enter contract negotiations with the superintendent. I am here in support of leadership stability and renewing this contract. I've appreciated Mr. Graff's uh, leadership. He has managed well through the con uh, comprehensive district design process, which removes barriers to student achievement. Previous superintendents talk about sweeping changes, but Mr. Graff is the only superintendent who has followed through on the big structural changes during the time that my kids have been in public schools. Mr. Graff has performed, performed admirably, admirably, 
during difficult times with student achievement and education equity at the center of his work. Renew his contract and give him the opportunity to build on the work of the last two years. Leadership stability is critical. Thank you. And Jose De La Rosa. Buenas tardes. Necesito intérprete, por favor. Good evening, everybody. Mi nombre es Dulce de la Rosa. My name is Dulce de la Rosa. Madre de dos estudiantes de MPS. Mother of two students from MPS. Pero en esta ocasión vengo en representación de 30 familias. But in this occasion I came in representation of two families. De la escuela Linde. From school Linde. Acudieron a mí. They came to me. Porque la escuela no está preparada. Because the school is not prepared. Para tener estas 30 familias en esa escuela. To have these 30 families attending the school. Los niños no hablan inglés. The children do not speak English. Y la escuela no tiene suficiente personal bilingüe. And the school does not have enough bilingual staff. No, no tienen acceso al internet. Al internet. They do not They have, do access, have to access, access to internet. Y los padres me dicen que MPS les dijo que no hay suficientes hotspots para proveerles. And MPS has told the, the parents that they don't have enough hotspots for the families and they cannot do anything about it. Esto es una emergencia. This is an emergency. Esta situación es producto de los cambios de CDD. This situation is the result of the changes with the CDC. Estos niños no tuvieron lugar en una de las escuelas donde tienen programa bilingüe. These children did not have a place to be at one of the places where they offer bilingual education. En cada reunión del CDD alegaban que había suficientes espacios. However, in each reunion or meeting that we were there, they assured that you guys have a space for these children. Cosa que yo siempre estuve segura que era mentira. Thing that I, I was always sure that you were lying. Necesito que den seguimiento a este caso, por favor. I need you to do a follow-up to this case. Porque los niños no pueden estar así. Because children cannot be like this. Llegaron a una escuela donde no está preparada. They came to a school that is not prepared. Donde no se sienten bienvenidos. Where they are not welcome. Donde no hay cómo satisfacer sus necesidades. Where they are not meeting their needs. Necesitamos que los fondos se utilicen equitativamente. I need you to utilize the funds that you are receiving in an equal way. Realmente equitativamente. Really in equity. Piensen en las necesidades, no no den parejo. You need to think of the needs of every single children. Don't just give money away like this. Cada niño tiene diferentes necesidades. Each children have different needs. Y necesito que den seguimiento, por favor. Espero una pronta respuesta para and, este caso. And I'm demanding a prompt and fast response to this. You need to have a follow up of it. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you again for everyone who spoke and took the time to share their thoughts with us, um, both here in person and by voicemail. Um, next item is reports and recommendations from the superintendent. I'm sorry, Chair. I'm just going to move a, a, a short recess. Uh, short recess been moved. Second. Been second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Um, let's come back 10 minutes. Five minutes. Okay, we will be back at 6.30. Thank you.
board members. Thank you. I know we've got a couple members who are still making their way back to the dais. Um, but we're going to get started. If we get quiet down in the room or take the conversation to the lobby. OK, directors, after superintendent's opening remarks and comments, we're going to have an update on transportation and a brief presentation on the school calendar development. After each of those items, we will pause briefly for any director questions or comments. Superintendent Graff, please go ahead with your opening remarks and then please go straight into the transportation update. All right, thank you, Chair Ellison. Uh, good evening, student representative Gebra Meskel, directors, staff, and those of you who are joining us here via live stream. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging two important celebrations that are happening this week, um, each highlighting communities within our city and our schools. Yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day, and today is Latino Heritage Day in Minneapolis Public Schools, as declared by the board in 2014, which, which falls within Latino Heritage Month. Um, these days really do offer an opportunity to both honor the continuing contributions of these communities, and also for reflection on how we can better serve our Indigenous and Latino students. I, I want to note um, that I, we are having a virtual Latino Heritage Month district-wide celebration this Thursday, and I invite, invite everyone who can join us virtually. Um, it's at 4 p.m., and in addition to the events that we have planned at our schools to mark the day in the month, um, we'll have this celebration. The details to join this Thursday's event are available in both English and Spanish, and they can be found on our district's uh, social media. I also want to provide some updates on our ongoing COVID-19 response efforts, beginning with the hopeful news that there may be, may soon be vaccines available for young students. Um, as you've heard the announcement, they're looking at those students under ages of under the age of 12. Um, I continue to encourage all those who are currently eligible to get a vaccine or a vaccine booster to do so as soon as possible. As we know, this is one of the most important tools we have in slowing the spread and minimizing the impact of the virus. On that point, as you know, this Friday, October 15th, marks the effective date of the board's resolution, um, certifying vaccination or submitting regular testing, submitting to regular testing for all of our MPS employees, as well as contractors, partners, and volunteers who have direct contact with students. Staff members can now log in and indicate how they will meet the requirement, which takes just a minute. I was able to do it earlier this week, and we have been sending out notifications and reminders to staff um, on the process to do that. If selecting the testing option, um, or if, if you select the testing option, more information will be provided on that process. And while in accordance with the resolution, uh, covered persons have the option to either be vaccinated or to undergo regular testing, I would like to remind all of our staff that choosing the vaccination option potentially means more testing resources available for those who are not yet eligible for the vaccine, including our students. Um, we also, we do also know that regular testing is another important virus mitigation tool. And Minneapolis Public Schools is committed to providing free voluntary tests to students and staff as our supply allows, um, while also ensuring we have the ability to administer the staff testing program for those who select that option. And as it was covered in the media last week, and I believe was also mentioned here this evening, we did just receive a shipment from the state of some free tests. And we encourage families to request these student tests directly from your school. Again, while keeping in mind that the number of tests we have access to is clearly um, and currently very limited. For those who are able, uh, please consider utilizing one of the many free community testing sites at the airport, at the convention center, or at another local uh, location around the city. And on all COVID-19 related fronts, uh, to ensure we have the best information and keeping our keep evaluating our practices and protocols. We do keep meeting and consulting with our regional support team, which includes staff from the city of Minneapolis, uh, city of the city of Minneapolis health department. And as noted here this evening and at past meetings, um, recently the topic of discussion was that which we heard about uh, in the public comments, the minimum length of the quarantine period for unvaccinated students who come into close contact with a positive COVID-19 case. 
Um, I will note here tonight that we are finalizing plans now to soon move to uh, from a 14 day minimum quarantine period to 10 days. And this is in alignment with the local state and federal guidance. Um, again, more details will be shared in the coming days and this will go into effect at some point this week. So I appreciate all the comments that we've received this evening and also want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate the regional support team and everyone else who has been supporting us as we've um, been working through these decisions with the best interest of our students, academics, health and safety in mind. We will continue to provide updates on our COVID-19 mitigation measures to the board at, at future meetings as well. Um, also upcoming for future board meetings, we'll be bringing back the next iteration of the district strategic plan following the discussion with the board at the September 28th Committee of the Whole meeting. I want to thank you again, Chair Ellison, and all the board directors for the great continued discussion and for the time and effort you put into finalizing this plan following our August retreat. Our team is now working to incorporate the board's feedback into a couple of different options for final consideration. And of course, just to reinforce, this plan will represent our roadmap for the next phase of the work uh, to deliver on the goals and vision that we laid out in the recent uh, uh, comprehensive district design. We do plan to also provide the board with a status update on the comprehensive district design implementation at the number November business meeting now that we have um, begun to get the initial enrollment data. And amidst everything else that's happening, uh, there is an election in Minneapolis this year. And I do want to remind all voters listening to please check out the options to vote early this election. As always, many of our schools are serving as polling places on election day, which is Tuesday, November 2nd. But voters can cast their ballot now by mail or in person as the city's early voting center. Um, early voting means fewer people in the school buildings on election day. And it means less disruption to the school day for our students and staff. And although when I was a teacher and a building principal, having voters in the school did provide a great learning opportunity, uh, the pandemic makes this election a good one to vote early. And I encourage everyone to check out those options. Um, and in partnership with the city, we will of course accommodate every eligible voter who comes to vote in person on election day. And finally, Chair Ellison, before I provide a status update on transportation efforts, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge our employees and their well-being during these times. We've discussed here often the, the impact the pandemic has had on our students and families, and it's a, extremely important to, to recognize and to know that that's our first and foremost uh, mission here in the district. But we also need to recognize the daily emotional strain it has had on, and continues to have on our staff, uh, those who are caring for our kids. The expectations and requests that have been placed on our district, our teachers, our school support staff, our, our school and district leaders for the past two years is overwhelming. And over the last week, I've spoken with school staff and building leaders and it's abundantly clear that we are past pandemic fatigue and we're now well into pandemic exhaustion. Uh, the emotional well-being of our staff is of significant concern for me and we must continue to look for ways to support adults beyond what we are currently doing. And I asked the board to to join me in this effort and this work as we prioritize and align our expectations in the face of this crisis so we can all take care of ourselves and most importantly, be able to take care of our students. So with that, Chair Ellison, um, if, if with your permission, I will move into the transportation update. Um, as, as mentioned, I'd like to provide a status update on our transportation system. I know this has been top of mind for many these first few weeks of school. And again, we'll acknowledge the frustration and challenge that many families have experienced as Minneapolis public schools and districts are, are around the state um, and across the country are trying to adapt to the nationwide bus driver shortage. We are working very hard to address the driver shortages as best as we can. And I want to publicly thank our transportation staff and their drivers and our drivers for going above and beyond to ensure our students have buses uh, to and from school every day. While we still have challenges with some routes, the number of challenges um, and with those routes has significantly reduced in the, has been significantly reduced in the past week. <clears throat> um, changes we've made to shift to more of a community school model, even in the midst of this driver shortage have really yielded the reduction of regular education bus routes and shorter ride, ride times for students as we anticipated. 
we are continuing to look for new solutions. And I want to review here this evening what we've been doing to increase capacity and service and introduce a few ideas that we're exploring, uh, which are designed to lessen the impact of the driver shortage. Of course, this driver shortage has really caused all of us to think creatively in order to transport as many students as possible to and from school safely. We started the year with 37 routes that had no drivers, and we were also experiencing same day coverage shortages of 12 to 20 routes. And just for some context, one route does not mean it's one particular bus to one location. It could mean several different um, stops in different schools. Through partnership with our families um, and our schools, we've been able to greatly reduce that number to between five to 10 routes daily. Um, and well, that's great. Um, we still have an impact by these shortages. With our after school programming starting up last week, and we have more programs being added this and in the coming weeks, along with the impending cold weather um, and potentially, uh, not potentially, but inevitably snow, we know that staffing will continue to be a challenge for us. A few of the ways that we've been able to reduce the, the number of routes not covered by school bus drivers has been one by shifting our service um, where possible to type three vehicles and are exploring those partnerships with community organizations and other bus or, and type three contractors. And a type three vehicle um, are those carrying nine passengers or less by definition. So it can be a, a passenger van, a minivan, or a passenger car. Type three vehicles do not require a special driver's license, um, like our buses require a commercial driver li driver's license. Um, they do not require additional endorsements, like a yellow school bus, but they do require the drivers to be certified and undergo background driving and driving records checks and trainings. Minneapolis Public Schools has increased the amount of work for contractors by providing type three service. And we're also looking to expand our own fleet uh, to include more type three vehicles so more of this work can be performed by MPS staff and reducing how much type three routing is contracted out to vendors. We've also continued the opt out process which we introduced last spring where families can receive mileage from the district for transportation of their students. And we'll soon be adding an option for middle schoolers to opt out of district transportation service and receive a Metro Transit go-to card. So similar to what we do at the high school level, um, we'll make that available to our middle school students and families who feel it's appropriate. And as of last week, we had 2,463 families opt out and about um, 1,800 families request reimbursements. And this has helped us accelerate optimizing our routes by removing those non-riders and reducing the number of drivers we are short. We've also worked to hire more bus aides for regular education buses, as having a second adult on the bus does assist with the driver retention, performance, um, on-time arrivals, seating charts, and other important measures as part of the transportation. And then I, I want everyone to know that the Minnesota Department of Education and the state of Minnesota are also aware of the staff shortages um, that are affecting our school's ability to provide consistent transportation for students. I engage in weekly conversations with superintendents across the, the district, or excuse me, across the state and across the nation. Um, and locally, we're working with our colleagues um, at other districts, as well as the governor's office to look for possible solutions. And um, area superintendents did recently meet with the Minnesota Department of Education commissioner and representatives from the governor's office on the school bus transportation challenge we're facing. And then finally, we're continuing to explore options that may reduce the reliance on yellow school bus transportation, including looking at um, increasing the distance a student walks from their home address to their bus stop. And in certain areas of the city, always considering safety uh, to decrease the number of bus stops on a route as we know that we're not fully utilizing the quarter mile for elementary and the half mile walk to stop distances that are allowed by MPS regulation. But we are looking at the size of our walk zones as compared to community school boundaries on a school by school basis. And some opportunities may exist in certain areas of the city to reduce or eliminate the need for any regular education busing. However, I do want to note at this time that this will not include those walk zones that were recently reduced for safety reasons at 21 of our schools. So we will still hold those um, schools in the, the current state that they are in for this year. Some longer term um, solutions used in conjunction with other bus stop efficiencies. Um, we're looking at beginning 
begin looking at integrating some of our special needs busing into our regular ed busing, um, always with the, the attention to the student's IEP and exploring a transportation system where families register for transportation versus automatically being routed for transportation based on enrollment and placement. Um, we know that these last two options do require a bit more intensive engagement with our families and support uh, over the summer months. And so we'll continue to um, look for that engagement and I'm happy to take any questions regarding transportation, Chair Ellison. I will note that uh, Lisa Beck, our Executive Director of Transportation is a uh, support staff here who's with us uh, virtually this evening and can assist with answers. Thank you, Superintendent. Directors, if you have any questions or comments on transportation, please hit your request to speak. We're all good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, you can now go ahead with your school calendar development parameters. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Again, I, I just want to acknowledge that's a lot of information for the board to take in, but I do think it's important for me to mention it publicly. Um, so as a reference point, tonight I wanted to um, share with you a little bit of information about our, our calendar process. As many of you know, this current 21-22 school year calendar is in the last year of our adopted three-year calendar cycle. Um, so we've begun by convening a staff calendar committee to bring forward recommendations for board consideration and approval. The committee is meeting currently with a plan uh, for us to present recommendations for a first reading at the November business meeting and a vote at the December, uh, final vote at the December business meeting. And to help support and guide this process, I wanna share an outline of some of the required elements, whether that be in state law or in our collective bargaining agreements as well as some of the, the factors we need to consider so um, we can hear any initial board feedback tonight. So before I share some of the specifics, I do wanna stress that when we're working within a, a fairly rigid set of parameters, there's not a lot of flexibility outside of what we have this year um, without making trade-offs in other areas that might've been previously seemed non-negotiable. Um, so in short, choices, even choices to do what some may feel is the right thing, uh, we will have to have uh, a trade-off and consequences in other ways. Having reflected on the, the existing parameters and the number of potential considerations that could have uh, consequential impacts on the calendar, I will be asking the committee to take any feedback from tonight's discussion um, and consider bringing forward a set of options for a decision. Uh, one overarch own overarching assumption that we have been working from is that the district will have a, what's referred to as an e-learning plan, e-learning day plan as a tool moving forward. Um, we do have that in this case this year, and you may recall we had to use that last year um, as well. And although I know it's got a reputation as being a kind of a, a bummer for snow days, um, the ability to not have to make up those inclement weather days um, as we're allowed those five inclement weather days is really an essential tool that, tool that allows us some options and flexibility with the calendar. So if we don't have the option for e-learning days, we would be on a very tight um, student contact number of hours and any inclement weather would certainly mean a makeup day elsewhere. So aside from the e-learning plan, the primary requirements within which we need to operate are the minimum student contact hours by state law, and that varies for elementary, middle, and high school. Um, we're required to start after Labor Day by state law unless there's a large construction project that is happening and that would require us to submit something to the state for approval on that. Um, contractual requirements of teacher duty days and record keeping days and professional development. So those are all part of our collective bargaining agreement that we have currently um, in existence right now that we have to consider. District holidays, including the, the recently added Juneteenth um, that was approved and supported by the board this past year. And then relatively uh, equivalent days across quarters. So looking at four quarters in our school year, finding a balance of the number of days um, to make it um, useful in, in terms of uh, presenting the curriculum and, and coursework for students. The next set of factors that could be changed but have traditionally been upheld, um, and this is again where guidance is helpful or consideration for, for trade-offs here. Full winter break of two weeks so when we head into December, traditionally we've had two full weeks of uh, winter break. 
a full break, a full spring break of one week. So in the spring, one, one full week off. And then finally, the areas where the board is most needed to develop recommendation options are around um, the approach of what do we want to take with significant religious holidays or other cultural observances that fall on typically scheduled school days. Um, you'll note if it's the first day of school and we have a culturally significant holiday or um, a culturally significant uh, a day at the end of the year, uh, it's important that we take those into consideration. Um, what approach do we want to take with election days? So as we've talked about here today already, um, election day and the impact that has on our schools. So certainly having some flexibility if we want to adjust our calendar on election days. And then what trade-offs are we willing to make in order to accommodate any of these considerations? So that's kind of an overview, Chair Ellison, of where we are, where we are at this process. And I bring it to the board just for any kind of uh, feedback and uh, guidance that um, the board members want to provide at this time. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, directors, if you have any feedback or comments you would like to give um, Director Elamin. I, I do have a question um, in regards to the religious holidays. Thank you, Chair. Um, being Muslim, uh, just trying to recognize the two views that we have, the Eid al-Ahad and the Eid al-Fitr. I would like for us to open up that discussion. Um, we do have a lot of Muslim families that we serve both students and staff. And so as we um, plan the calendar for the next three years, I would like to make sure that we um, have some conversation. I can bring uh, information to help whatever is needed, being again that I am Muslim and it is a holiday that I think we would love to see noted and recognized for the families that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. A student representative, Deborah Mesco. Um, well, I would like to recommend uh, not only Eid um, for there to be no school during Eid. I think, especially going to South High School, where there's such a large Muslim American population, um, it's a really big deterrent for students when they have tests or assignments due on that day and they aren't able to go to school. Um, and I would also like to recommend that Indigenous People Day um, has a day off for school as well. I really feel like if we're going to recognize that day, um, we should treat it the same as we do other you know, recognize holidays and have a day off from school for it as well. Thank you. Director Caprini. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Chair Ellison. Um, I just have a question, um, and I also agree with uh, Director Elamine and student um, uh, Gabor Mesco. <laughs> um, the winter break and spring break, two weeks. Um, typically, we have um, our winter academy and spring academy. Is that for the full two weeks or is it just one week that students are in school? Chair Ellison, uh, Director Caprini, I'll have to check, but I think we've adjusted that over the, the years, depending upon the staff availability um, and the timing of when those uh, holidays actually occur over the winter break. Okay. So I'll have to check on that, but I know we, um, spring break, we usually have it during that time frame. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Ali. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to, I did agree with uh, Director Alamin and student representative, Kebra Meskal. This is very important uh, in this time of, uh, where we need the most of the time that uh, we want to accommodate everybody. We want to accommodate every student. And the student population from the Muslim faith are very significant in Minneapolis public schools. The students and the staff are very significant number of them. And therefore, it's very important that we must accommodate our families. And it's, it's I believe it's about the time. And I, I, I fully support that we need to put those two days in the calendar and make sure that, that we accommodate these students. Same thing like any other uh, faith uh, holidays, religious holidays. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Ali. Uh, Director Arneson. Uh, thank you. I have a question or 
maybe I'm restating what you said. I'm hearing you say that we have, um, in our like looking at the calendar this year, we've pretty much exhausted, if we care to start after Labor Day and end, like about the second week in June, right? Like we will, we've exhausted kind of how many days off we can have. So if we add days off, we will need to, we will need to um, um, add some days back in, right? It basically, ha having worked on a lot of calendars, I think I've let it known that it's not my favorite discussion at all. I feel like calendars, everyone has an opinion on the calendar and it's one of the more controversial things uh, we, we uh, talk about. But I'm wondering, and so these are all really good ideas, but my questions are, I'm hearing you say, uh, if the we have two weeks off in December, we have one week off late March, early April, and we are currently doing some catch up, some uh, academic catch up. So am I hearing you say that if we were to shorten those those periods off, for example, so we could be more inclusive of others, of other days, would that impact our ability to offer um, academic assistance? Chair Ellison, um, Director Arneson, thanks for the, the question. Um, so again, I will have to confirm with um, my academic team, but I believe the winter break, we have a two week period and I, I know that we do not have um, the academy occurring for two weeks during that time. There's some you know, shortened time frame there. So if there's a further reduction of that two week window, I would assume that we would have to reduce the, the academy time frame shorter there. I think the other consideration is that that is operated by staff um, who are already um, under contract and are taking on additional responsibilities. They're not just, that's not their sole job. So some of that is over their vacation and their break. Um, with regard to the winter break, I'm fairly confident that that time is completely used up for those academies. So any reduction there will have a direct impact on, um, for the spring break, will have a direct impact on the, the, the number of days that we could provide support for students during that time. Okay. So it doesn't mean that it's the, uh, it does not mean that it's a valid discussion to be had, but I just wanted to be really clear about that so we all know that that is the discussion that we're having. Second, I'm wondering if the two weeks off in December and that one week off in spring break, is that currently written in a contract? Um, I do not believe that's in any of our existing negotiated agreements right now, the duration of winter break or spring break. Those okay. are. So that is flexible that as is far as really contracts. That is the board administration. Uh, we have some other release days beyond, beyond winter break and spring break. End of quarter, I believe we have at least one day off at the end of every quarter. So that's three days, roughly. Are those written in the contract? Yes. So I'll have Senior Officer Sullivan speak to that. Um, and when we refer to the contract, I think generally speaking, we're talking about the um, collective bargaining agreement we have with the MFT. Um, but there are days that are in those specific, in that specific contract, and then there are other requirements in some of our other contracts. Okay. Uh, Charleston, um, Board Director, thank you for the question. Director Arneson, there are uh, specific requirements in the contract around record keeping days written into the contract after each quarter. Um, there's also language in the contract around parent teacher conferences uh, that is in there. And then for the teacher's contract, we do have we've written into the contract 196 duty days that we're required to meet. Um, we also have other contractual obligations and other collective bargaining agreements, including um, professional development. Um, so those are all considerations as part of the calendar. Uh, thank you. And then I'm wondering, we have three days off, like next week. Are though I know that's the traditional conference time, but are all three days conference time? And is that written into? Is there? Do we have some understanding about those three days? Yep. Those three days are all accounted for in the contract. We have parent-teacher conferences one day, MEA day, which is actually written into the contract of what is, what is considered there. And for this year, because we didn't have the flex day at the start of the school year, we have a conference conversion day on that Friday. Okay, so those are accounted for. And then I'm wondering, I believe we take off often three days off at Thanksgiving. Uh, are those written, do we have some understanding or obligation with those three days? I think that Thursday and Friday are considered holidays in the contract. Um, we may have some flexibility with the Wednesday, but that would be something that the calendar committee would need to look at as well. Okay, great. All right, well, my input is that there have been some great um, 
great suggestions raised up, and I'm certainly happy to support those. Um, I am also just want to just acknowledge out loud, just knowing that everyone I've talked to ever in my 10 years would like to ideally start after Labor Day and by Memorial Day and have many days off in between. So just knowing that we need to um, you know, be creative on that, and I'd be willing to go later in the school year if that's what we want to do, or um, if we have some flexibility in some of these other days that are not, we don't, are not, I guess, spoken for one way or the other. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, Superintendent, would you like to go ahead? Oh, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, I appreciate the, the conversation here um, this evening. And so what we will do is I will follow back up with uh, Senior Officer Sullivan, who's helping support the, the committee discussion. And we more than likely will bring back a couple of things for consideration. Because again, if we have a starting point and a preferred kind of uh, or number of days we have to have in place, um, it'll be really important for us to take a look at that. Because every time we put forward a new calendar, uh, people are always wondering, like, why are we having school at this point? So I think it's really a healthy discussion for all of us to, to be clear on that we have to meet the number of days required by the state. We have some contractual obligations. And then um, just looking at the, the employee workforce and, and trying to find that consistency for our students. Um, so look forward for some more information in November. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Our next item is a report um, from the Policy Committee. Policy Chair Polly, would you like to go ahead with your committee's report? Thank you, Chair Ellison. In addition to a couple of regular policy reviews, this past month, the Policy Committee began processing the recommendation report from the School Names Advisory Committee uh, by reviewing our current policy and regulation language on changing school names. We discussed the current standards and limitations for new names, as well as how we would need to work closely with the Finance Committee as the fiscal aspect um, will be crucial to understand as our board determines next steps on the committee's recommendations. So we'll continue this discussion in a coming month uh, in the committee. We also forwarded two policy revisions with the recommendation for approval here tonight. So instead of our normal um, two meeting process, as the changes are only due to legal updates. So these policy updates to our policies on both student and personnel data uh, will be discussed later on in the agenda tonight. Chair Ellison, that's the policy committee's report. Thank you. Uh, directors, any questions about the policy report? Thank you. Seeing none, we're going to move on. Now we're moving into the action portion of our meeting. We have a couple of items we need to vote on. First is approval of the consent agenda. The consent agenda includes routine items that do not involve major policy, budget, or taxing decisions, bond awards, or items related to the superintendent's contract or evaluation. Director Caprini, will you please move approval of this item? So moved. Thank you. May I get a second? Second. Thank you. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Thank you. That motion carries and consent agenda is approved. Our next item is a resolution relating to the state credit enhancement program labeled as resolution 2021-50. This was ref referred here by the Finance Committee. So, Director Caprini, will you please move this resolution? So moved. You may get a second. Second. Thank you. Approval of the resolution labeled 2021 50 on the State Credit Enhancement Programs be moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Thank you. That motion moves. is approved. Our next item is a resolution relating to general obligation long-term facilities maintenance, labeled as resolution 2021-49. This was referred here by our finance committee. Director Caprini, may I please? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Approval of the resolution relating to the general obligation long-term facilities maintenance, labeled as resolution 2021-49, has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Thank you, that motion carries and the resolution is approved. Our next item is the revision of policy 3270 regarding sales and leases of real property. As recommended by the policy committee, this policy revision would authorize the superintendent 
to create a process in regulation for handling unused facilities that would be classified as surplus by the board. Director Policy, can I please get a motion to approve this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Approval of the revision to policy 3270 has been moved and seconded. So any discussion? Student Representative Gabor Mesco? Um, I would just like to ask, is there a way um, in the contract to have either a certain amount of time, let's say like six to 10 years, or an ability to keep track of the ownership and the uses of the building and how it affects the community around it? Superintendent. I'm sorry, Student Representative Gabor Mesco, are you referring to the policy? Or, or uh, the no, the, the sale, oh, I think I, if for the maintenance, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the one for selling old school buildings. Selling buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we keep track of the impact? Is that yeah. Um, let me let me ask uh, Ryan Strack to see if he can uh, respond to your question. is and what their plans are for the thank you what their plans are for the property how much investment they're putting into it um, so the answer is it depends that is one of the things that's in in consideration as a part of the regulation so that would be something that would be appealing right the board would the board and school district would like to say yes you can't sell this later on down the road to someone that we isn't in alignment with our values perhaps uh, but there that's a question for the um, individual contract so it's something that will definitely be considered as part of the process though. And if it's something that the board didn't feel comfortable with because there wouldn't be that agreement in place, the board wouldn't need to, to, to sell the property. Yep. So that this process is meant to lay out a very transparent and clear process for everyone, but still uh, is in the responsible hands of the board, which has the authority to sell and lease property. Yeah, again, so just to, just to reinforce that as we have this process set up, um, it would come before the board ultimately for a discussion, a public discussion. So at that point, if there were um, questions about the, 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 the buyer of the property, uh, those could be specifically answered at that moment versus having anything beyond what we have in our, our policy right now because it will require some limitations. Um, and more specifically, the discussion at that time is probably going to be the, the critical um, part of the, the sale. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. That motion carries and the resolution is approved. Our next item is the revision of policy 8114 regarding board election districts. As recommended by the policy committee, this new policy would codify several election related provisions from state law into policy. And most notably confirm that the school board will use the park and recreation election districts for our district seats. Director Polly, can I please get a motion to approve this resolution? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. The adoption of policy 8114 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Thank you, that motion carries and the resolution is approved. Our next item is revision of policies 4200 and 5690 on the topics of personnel data and student data respectively. These are the legal updates mentioned by Director Polly earlier in this meeting. So this is coming straight to action tonight, the policy committee's recommendation. Director Polly, can I please get a motion to approve this resolution? A second. second. Thank you. The revisions to policy 4200 and 5690 have been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Thank you. That motion carries and the resolution is approved. 
For this next item, I will defer to the author, Vice Chair Arneson, to introduce and speak to her resolution. Please go ahead, Director Arneson. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight, it's my intention to introduce this resolution for consideration, but I'm gonna bring it back next month for a vote. And my goal, I'd like to just lay it out so we uh, know what we're all considering. So my goal with this resolution is to get more students vaccinated. So this would mandate that our student athletes would need to get a COVID test weekly with an option to get a COVID-19 vaccine instead. I would hope they would choose the vaccine. And you may think that this is prioritizing sports over academics, but actually I would argue that this resolution supports our students staying in the classroom by increasing testing, but more importantly, increasing the vaccine rate for a large group of students in a way that is legal and practical. So um, right now, this is the only way to stop school closures like Edison and quarantines, whether it's 10 days or 14 days. We have to increase the vaccination rate if we would like more kids to be in school. Right now we know, we know that in Minneapolis and Minnesota, not all people are vaccinated. That varies by communities and we certainly know that the rate of young people are, is significantly lower than adults, in some cases up to 20 points lower, are teenagers. In the meantime, we're embroiled in a nationwide fight about medicine and appropriate public health measures. I don't think it matters how people have gotten to a space of rejecting conventional public health measures, but these large numbers of vaccinated people are impacting our students so much that I think it's worth to insist that we take every legal and practical option available to us. So to outline what this would do, athletics is a privilege, not a right, unlike the classroom where we definitely, we had this conversation last month and we definitely have, I think, good qualms about uh, limiting access to our students to the classroom. Athletics, unlike other activities, we already have criteria that students must meet to participate in high school athletics, and I'm talking about high school athletics, including health clearance. Furthermore, we are entering the winter sports season. That will be indoors. It will have close contact. If you have ever looked at the object of wrestling, for example, there will be close contact, and there certainly will be exposures, especially with our current vaccine rate. And exposures will mean that some students or even entire teams will shut down for a period of time, and those students will be not in the classroom, which we know has academic consequence. So this mandates testing, but I wanna be clear that testing will not protect kids from exposures, nor will it end quarantines. So I'm not interested and won't support any suggestion to use testing to replace quarantines, whatever quarantine amount we come up with for unvaccinated people. However, if students show us a vaccination card, they won't need to submit to weekly testing and this is a big deal for teams, they can have a much shorter quarantine period, thus lessening the impact on their team, getting them back to a healthy activity, and keeping whatever door is open for them with athletics. So I have an example. We all know that Edison recently shut down. One team had nearly 100% vaccination rate, and they were, back at, they were back on it within three to five days. Another team, had about a 30% vaccination rate. That's like 70% of the team was not vaccinated and they uh, forfeited games for two weeks. And those students, they, they were the entire school, it impacted to the rate that 60% that of the school had some sort of close contact. It had significant academic consequence. So I believe we must develop ways to force discussion about health 
and the community impact of ignoring COVID, no matter the reason that people got there. So just a note about the testing access. Part of the reason I'd like to come back next month is there's a lot of discussion about testing and access right now at the state level. As certainly we know that the state has released a number of tests, I believe around 35,000, which uh, is not enough to uh, provide weekly tests for our students or our staff. Um, so there is some discussion to be had about that. I do know that our staff is committed to ensuring that those who cannot access tests like to figure it out, but we do have a lot of discussion to be had about if it's practical for, our, uh, for us as a district to be um, implementing a testing system. And that is not my intent of this resolution and in part why I'm focusing on athletics unlike our conversation last month, because again, athletics is an optional activity that already requires medical clearance to play. So our athletic department prides themselves on being student first, student athletes, and I believe protecting students' health will keep them in the classroom in what is an, a recognized higher risk activity. So that is my resolution, and I will bring it back, Chair, next month for a vote. Thank you. Directors, any questions or comments on this item? Yes, Director Eileen. Um, just, I, I guess my concern being one when we do, if we do decide to go forward with this, we have to leave room for those that are, um, that have religious obligations that for whatever reason will not take it. We also need to leave room for um, our history as African-American people when it comes to the vaccine. So I don't, I understand the importance of health, but I think we also need to realize um, the significance behind what we're doing and making sure that we can accommodate the needs that will come with that. When we say that we want weekly testing, when we put this extra um, option or extra requirement on the student and the family, they have to one, be able to get the testing, which it sounds like we will work towards that, but two, as far as drop-off centers to make it more convenient, because now we're asking parents to, um, that may not have transportation, to be able to do all these additional things. So it's a lot for us to discuss and to really just take into consideration what we're asking, who would be more impacted, and what are the resources that we're bringing to accommodate the things that we are asking for too. Thank you. Um, let me ask Student Representative Gabriel Meskel. Um, I would say that I think this resolution is something that a lot of student athletes really want to happen. They don't want the same thing at Edison happen to their school and for cases to spread or for them to lose out on the opportunities um, on their sports teams and at their high schools. Um, but I also say that there needs to be consideration for Native American and African American students on the distrust they have for vaccines, um, and not only vaccines, but a lot of like medical institutions, um, and also the ability of a lot of families to get the vaccine. I mean, a lot of families don't really have access to like immediate medical stuff, and I would say at least at South, a lot of students actually go to their clinic um, to get their physicals done. Um, because their families don't have the time to take them to the doctor or they don't have access to those kinds of things. Um, and so I guess on one hand, I'm kind of, I think this is something that should move forward. Um, but I also am wondering if there's a possibility to streamline this process and have clinics and high schools be able to offer vaccines or to offer resources to get vaccines to students. A lot of students on sports teams just don't have that many resources at home and a lot of them rely on their school clinics because it's right there, it's free, it's easy to use, and they have people in those clinics that they know and trust. Um, and I know that this is something that's been come up a lot during this meeting, um, and I don't want to go into it too much, but especially for those students who just, either their family or themselves like, don't trust this process, um, just keeping COVID testing open would be good. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, this is a really heavy conversation and there's a lot of considerations. And that's in part because that's partially why I want to raise it, right? 
like a lot of people have come to this to this discussion. This has been a nationwide discussion for quite some time now, and a lot of people. Uh, clearly, we have a large number of people who are not vaccinated, and they've come into that space for a lot of different reasons, right? Like, definitely. So first, I'm going to note that this is this is a testing mandate, not a vaccine mandate. You can not do weekly testing by getting the vaccine, but ultimately is a testing mandate. So I will, again, there are options for students to remain in athletics if they are not vaccinated, but they, they will need to do testing. That is what this mandate is, right? And um, ultimately, this will be a discussion that we need to have, but um, we, we just need to make a decision as a board if we, the reality is that there, this is uh, testing and vaccine have been, um, are absolutely approved by um, the medical community, and there is negative impact if students are not being tested, if we don't know there's a spread. So we do need to have this discussion, and I do hope that this provides ultimately an opportunity for our school communities to have, have this discussion with students to provide the support. As far as student uh, vaccine clinics, I, uh, we are not a public, I'm just going to say that I, I don't think our schools are a public health facility, but I do know that we've had multiple school clinics, and I think we support, like, we're, like I, as far as I know, our school nurses are not um, authorized to just kind of give COVID shots. I think we probably would need to go through a pretty significant process to be, to be doing that. However, um, certainly Edison just had a vaccine clinic. I know we've had other vaccine clinics at our schools, and I know that our district, I'm confident that our district continues to be supportive of that. So, and again, with testing facilities as well. Like I, I do know that, well, the, for example, the state government has given us tests. They have not necessarily given us staff to administer that test. And I believe our school nurses do already have full-time jobs. So there will be, we, we will do need to have some discussion about our um, capacity. And, but we also know that the state is having that discussion. So I, I look forward to, for some of those details to kind of evolve over the next month. But do, do not want to exclude students. I, I absolutely want students to play sports. But I also know the reality is that Edison just didn't play sports for two weeks. Their homecoming was canceled. Their other, some other schools' homecoming were canceled because they were the opponent. Like there is a, there is a significant impact when a student gets COVID on an athletic team, not only in the classroom but on sports. The teams shut down, right? And we are going into winter sports indoors, which the CDC recognizes is on the state health department of a higher risk activity of more likely to spread COVID, which is more likely going to transmit into a classroom, which is going to have academic impact. And so this is a way to talk about that, something that we really need to talk about. So thank you. is a summary of superintendent's evaluation for last year. As you know, on October 5th, 2021, all nine members of the school board met in a duly noticed closed session to conduct the evaluation of the superintendent for the 2020-2021 school year. In accordance with Minnesota statute section 13D.05, subdivision three, this summary of the conclusions regarding the evaluation is being provided at this, the board's next open meeting following the closed session. The evaluation was conducted in four areas. First, a literacy goal to provide leadership to ensure all students receive standards aligned, differentiated, and culturally relevant daily literacy instruction, and that students have access to evidence-based interventions when needed. Second, a standard in the area of school district finances, budget development, and maintenance. Third, a standard in the area of human resources, hiring, and staff development, and fourth, a standard in the area of student support, emotional health, and social needs. Each evaluation area was assigned a potential rating of ineffective, developing, effective, or highly effective. The board recognizes that this time period being evaluated was among the most challenging periods for education in modern history, including several major shifts among learning formats due to the COVID-19 pandemic. On the literacy goal, the board determined that the superintendent received a rating of developing. On the school district finance standard, 
the board determined that the superintendent received a rating of effective. On the human resources standard, the board determined that the superintendent received a rating of effective and also noted the board's interest in a continued emphasis on supporting employees of color. And finally, on the student support standard, the board determined that the superintendent received a rating of highly effective. And that concludes my report on the evaluation. I'm gonna move the next item, which is to grant authorization to begin negotiations for a superintendent contract extension. Please note that if an agreement is reached, it would come back to this board for final approval. I second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to authorize negotiations for a superintendent contract extension. This will be a roll call vote. As I wait for members to let me know if you wanna speak, just hit the request to speak button. I hope you're considering where you would like the district to be in three to five years and whether this is the superintendent to get us there. Directors, please hit the request to speak button to get in the queue. Director Surreal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So help me to understand uh, what we are bringing to the table is uh, to grant the district permission to enter into negotiations uh, to extend the contract for the superintendent. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. I absolutely say no, because I will be voting no on this matter and I can tell you my reasons. Uh, the number one reason is the lack of a literacy plant that has not been implemented. Uh, saying that, I have received uh, numerous voicemails, uh, phone calls, and emails from my constituents saying that uh, it is time for new leadership and uh, they thank the leadership of the superintendent, but they do believe that it's time for a new person. And when you ask the question about uh, where do we see the district in the next three to five years, I do not believe that the current leadership can take us where our children need to be. Thank you. Thank you, Director Surya. Seeing no other comments. Okay, seeing no more speakers, I'll renew my motion to authorize that negotiations begin for a superintendent contract extension. Will the clerk please call the roll on this motion? Arneson. Yes. Elamine. No. Ali. No. Surio. No. Inns. Yes. Jordan. Yes. Caprini. Aye. Polly is a no. Ellison. No. Thank you. That motion carries. And the superintendent and I will begin process of negotiating a contract extension. No, Chair Ellison, no. you voted no, so five voted no, so it, I'm sorry. that would not happen. No. Oh, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I am so sorry. I'm changing that. I meant yes. Um, and the motion carries. It's been a long night. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, our final item tonight is time for directors to give a brief update on the committees they chair or on any other board related activities. Directors, if you have comments, please hit the request to speak button and I'll run through the list. Director Caprini. Uh, the finance committee meeting, um, the finance committee will meet October 19th at five o'clock. Student Representative Gabriel Mesco. Um, I just wanted to give an update on a slight change in some of the responsibilities for the student board position that I'm proposing. Um, I think that student representatives should give a yearly report of the things that happened during their time at the board, not only for the next student representatives to be able to review and see, but also for students in general to be able to have perspective on what happens during board meetings and um, what happens in administrations and committees. Um, you know, during my tenure here. I think it's really important just because um, of the limited time that I have here, it's only a year, to be able to leave something behind for the next student representatives. Thank you. Superintendent Graff. Uh, thank you, Chair Ellison. I just wanted to um, publicly acknowledge the, the vote of the board here around the uh, contract negotiations and just say that as a leader of a learning organization, feedback is essential and a, a growth mindset is expected. 
um, the areas of focus from what I received from feedback from the board um, were limited, but I will tell you that a significant amount of work remains ahead of us as a district. And in order for us to achieve progress, uh, we will need everyone aligned moving forward in the same direction. So with that, I thank you again for the opportunity to serve this board and this community and uh, appreciate the time for comments. Hi, thanks, Chair Holson. I just want to remind folks to fill out the uh, educational benefits form. I know that the, the date changes every year. I know one year was December 1st. Is that was how late they have, but I know it does fluctuate year after year. Um, like I said, if it takes maybe not even five minutes online, so please fill that out. And I will probably say this again next month like a broken record, because we just really need to, we really need to capture those dollars in the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, I um I want to say that a lot of times I use this moment, this space, to talk to my fellow board members and to the community and update y'all on things that I've done, and to inform you about upcoming events. But tonight I want to speak to the staff, and I think I speak for the whole board, and they'll tell me if I'm not. But um I want to let you know that we see you, we see you working so hard. We see you pouring love and understanding into your students and into each other. You're doing amazing work. And I know it hasn't been easy and it's not getting any easier. I wanted to let you know that we truly appreciate you. Seeing no other comments, Director Arneson, can I please get a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Second. Thank you. There's a motion to adjourn and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. This meeting is adjourned. Um, the next meeting is a committee of the whole meeting on October 26. Any members of the public who wish to join us for that or any other upcoming meetings need to visit our website or contact our board office to get registered in accordance with our current meeting guidelines. Okay, good night everyone.